Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the Human Rights Center of Tallinn University of Technology for the organization of this event and for inviting me to come and speak with you. It's always a pleasure to come to Estonia uh, and to I've had excellent cooperation over the years with colleagues uh, in various realms of life in my various capacities. I ran the main human rights non-governmental organization in Latvia uh, from 1994 to 2002. Then I was the Minister of Integration from 2002 to 2004, and now I run the research center at the University of Latvia. And in all of these capacities, I've had a regular and very fruitful cooperation with friends and colleagues in Estonia. Uh, today it is my great honor uh, to be here as representative of ECRI, the European Commission Against Racism and Intolerance, which is the Council of Europe's independent anti-racism monitoring body, uh, and I, of which I, I've been the chairman since the beginning of the year. Um, before I run into the challenges of, to equality and non-discrimination in Europe, let me say a few words about ECRI. Because I've discovered uh, that there are still some people in Europe who do not know what ECRI is. Um, now, the European Commission Against Racism and Tolerance uh, is composed of 47 experts, one from each member state of the Council of Europe. Um, I wonder if you know who Estonia's member is. It's Mark Nutt, uh, and I hope that you use him as a resource uh, in work against racism and intolerance. Um, there are 47 experts, and we have basically three different pillars of our work. And the core of our work is country by country monitoring. Uh, we've done, we do country visits uh, to all of the 47 countries of the Council of Europe. Uh, we prepare reports. Uh, the last report on Estonia was published uh, in March of 2010. It was the uh, fourth report on Estonia, so we are already in our fourth round, so we've done we're kind of four times 47. We've done very many country visits in the last 15 years. Uh, the second pillar of our work is work on general themes, where we put out general policy recommendations to assist governments uh, in identifying best practices uh, on model legislation against anti-discrimination, on specific themes, for example, on Islamophobia or anti-Semitism, or police and racial discrimination. And right now we're finishing up our 13th general policy recommendation on anti-gypsism. Um, and the fourth, uh, the third pillar of our work is relations with civil society. Uh, and I will talk about this uh, in, a, in a little more detail in a few moments. Uh, but first, some basic definitions. Um, ECRI has defined racism in the following way, as the belief that race, and here we use race in inverted commas, uh, because we do not <laughs> subscribe to the view that uh, humans can be divided into different races, uh, uh, that race, color, language, religion, nationality, meaning citizenship here, or national and ethnic origin, justify contempt for a person or the notion of superiority of a group of persons. Racial discrimination, um, in our view, constitutes a wide variety of phenomenon uh, and includes both direct and indirect discrimination. And the grounds include race, color, national or ethnic origin, nationality, uh, religion, and language. So it's a very, very broad mandate. You might notice in the context of the previous speaker's remarks, it doesn't include sexual orientation. Uh, there is some discussion about whether or not we should widen our mandate, uh, but uh, thus far uh, we have to remain within our mandate, which covers these grounds. In terms of cooperation with civil society, uh, first of all, I should say that many ECRI members, many of our 47 members, are either come from the NGO world or are professors, usually of law. So we have an intimate link uh, with civil society throughout Europe. Uh, NGOs and universities are very important sources of information and expertise for our work, both our country-by-country -country monitoring, as well as our work on special themes. Uh, NGOs and universities, as well, are very important conduits for disseminating our results, uh, education, advocacy work, and so on. Our, uh, very often, we're criticized by governments for not mentioning the sources uh, that we use in our reports. Where did you get this piece of information from? And our response is we don't mention uh, our sources in the text, but we have a large bibliography at the end of each report mentioning all the published sources. And sometimes uh, we, we say to countries, we know that your country would never go after critical NGOs, but there are some countries that might. We can't 
We can't verify absolutely every piece of information that we receive. If it's from a respectable source and it's been confirmed by several sources, uh, then we include it and we use it. Uh, look into it. <coughs> About emerging issues uh, in the struggle against racism and intolerance, um, first of all, I want to highlight the impact of the global economic crisis um, on our work. Uh, in our recent annual report, uh, we mentioned a number of direct and indirect uh, effects of the economic crisis. Uh, the first is budget cuts, of course, that have uh, a disproportionate impact on various vulnerable groups, including Roma, immigrants, asylum seekers. Another direct impact is on uh, budget cuts affecting equality bodies. Throughout Europe, uh, these bodies that are in charge of monitoring uh, discrimination, uh, reviewing complaints, doing public outreach work, they're, they're, in many places their uh, budgets have been slashed, staff have been laid off, and this has a serious impact uh, on the work of, of these bodies and makes life even more difficult for us in ECRI, because equality bodies are very important partners for us in our monitoring work. Uh, the indirect impact uh, is a little bit more difficult to identify, uh, but I think there are a number of uh, clear uh, areas where we can see it. Uh, when resources are scarce, people compete for resources. They often invoke uh, differences, differences on the ground of ethnicity, on the ground of color, uh, on the ground of religion, uh, and manipulate those for their own gain. So when, we have, when resources are scarce and people are competing for them, uh, this often strengthens racist attitudes, leads to scapegoating. People look for who is to blame for our difficulties. And very often, uh, the likely targets are not very far uh, to, to look for. Other emerging challenges, uh, migration. Uh, this is a huge debate uh, that has barely touched our region in the Baltic states, uh, but it is, a, it is raging in many countries throughout Europe. Sigmund Bauman, the renowned uh, sociologist, uh, gave a keynote address at our 10th anniversary uh, in 2005. And he linked, uh, he tried to answer the question, why are we losing the battle against racism and intolerance? And he said, we have all of these legal mechanisms, these bodies, this body of knowledge, this research, uh, activists, governmental bodies, but it seems like the problem is not going away. Why? And his answer, uh, he linked it to globalization, uh, which generates all kinds of insecurities for people that you're only as good as your last project. No longer can you work your entire life and be insured of slowly going up the career ladder, having a good pension. Something that happens in a faraway country can affect your job, can affect your security. Uh, and this leads to something that he calls liquid fear, which is kind of a vague existential insecurity uh, that creates a social demand for enemies. And the enemies, the most likely enemies in Zygmunt Bauman's view, and here I agree with him, are the foreigner, uh, the person who just arrived at your doorstep, who doesn't speak your language, or if he does, he means different things with the same words. He might look different. You don't know where to fit him in. Uh, and he is very often the likely target uh, for, uh, for your hatred, for your suspicion, uh, and so on. Uh, Europe, it's clear, uh, will continue to attract immigrants, both because of the push factors from other areas of the world where poverty and conflict uh, lead people to escape and look for a better life or a safer life, but also pull factors. All the demographers are pretty clear that we will need, that Europe, if Europe unless Europe makes some very, very difficult choices in the future uh, regarding cutting back social welfare, uh, <coughs> improving the use of technology, uh, that we will need uh, more immigrants in Europe to maintain our current standard of living. We don't necessarily need them. Uh, if we are willing to make very, very difficult choices. But it's clear uh, that the labor markets in many areas of Europe will continue to pull in immigrants from other areas of the world, uh, and the standard of living um, and the, the security and safety within Europe will continue to serve as a magnet uh, for people who are persecuted on various grounds throughout the world. This is creating all kinds of dilemmas uh, that we don't see so much in Northern Europe, but in Southern Europe, they are, very, they are a very controversial topic. I was recently at a conference on migration across the Mediterranean in Lisbon. And there, the biggest topic was about the mixed nature of the flows of immigrants, where in one boat you have asylum seekers, victims of trafficker, trafficking, the traffickers, 
and labor migrants. And sorting out who is who in this group uh, is very, very difficult. Uh, this also raises very difficult questions of burden sharing. You talk with representatives of the Maltese government or <clears throat> the Italian government or the Greek government, they want to know why are they, uh, who are just on the most vulnerable part of Europe's outer border, required to take a disproportionate share of the burden? What about sharing the burden with other countries in Europe? Now, in our area of the world, we know that there's not a whole lot of appetite for sharing the burden of southern Europe uh, in terms of dealing with migration, asylum seekers, and, and refugees. But this debate, uh, in my view, is going to become more acrimonious uh, in the coming years, and we have to be pre prepared for it. Another question, of course, is about the sustainability of the traditional refugee regime. Now, if we have, it, if we have these mixed flows uh, of migrants and various other groups, uh, this, of course, makes it very difficult uh, to continue the old practice of checking each person out, finding out whether they've been persecuted, going through the asylum procedure, giving them protection of some sort. Uh, and it raises all kinds of questions about where will we be 10 or 15 years from now uh, with this traditional refugee regime. Uh, 